Welcome to the webinar, Evaluating Novel Formulations and Emerging Agents in the Management of Acute Myeloid Leukemia, Enhancing Outcomes, Tolerability, and Access. This program is sponsored by the North American Center for Continuing Medical Education, LLC, and is supported by an educational grant from Jazz Pharmaceuticals. I'm Bill Cotterelli, Director of Pharmacy Revenue and Supply for Atrius Health and Harvard Vanguard Medical Associates, and I will be your presenter today along with Dr. Joseph Jersek, Professor of Medicine and Director of the Hematologic Malignancies Section at Columbia University Medical Center and Attending Physician at New York Presbyterian Hospital's Herbert Irving Comprehensive Cancer Center. This next slide shows our disclosures, which can also be found on the landing page of this activity. My goal in speaking to you today is to talk and quantify the clinical and economic burden of AML, including the factors that contribute to poor prognosis and increased costs, to leverage therapeutic advances and resource utilization data into informed plan decisions and formulary discussions, and to lightly touch upon and evaluate the clinical and pharmacoeconomic profiles of novel chemotherapeutic formulations and targeted agents. If you look on the left-hand side of your webinar platform, you'll see that there are additional resources regarding today's topic. Feel free to browse them if you'd like more information. And if you have any questions during this webinar, please enter them into the question box, and Dr. Jurisic and I will do our best to answer them in the question and answer session immediately following today's presentation. Acute myeloid leukemia is a cancer of the blood and bone marrow. This type of cancer usually progresses very quickly if not treated. It's the second most common type of acute leukemia in adults. AML is also called by a variety of additional names. You'll see them here on this slide. In AML, the myeloblasts in AML are abnormal and do not become healthy white blood cells. Leukemia cells can build up in the bone marrow and blood so that there's less room for the healthy white blood cells, red blood cells, and platelets. When this happens, infection, anemia, and bleeding issues may very well occur. The leukemia cells can spread outside the blood to other parts of the body. Advances in the treatment of AML have resulted in substantially improved complete remission rates. Treatment should be sufficiently aggressive to achieve complete remission because partial remission offers no substantial survival benefit. Approximately 60 to 70% of adults with AML can be expected to attain complete remission status following appropriate induction therapy. More than 25% of adults with AML can be expected to survive three or more years. Remission rates in adult AML are inversely related to age, with an expected remission rate of more than 65% for those younger than 60 years of age. This year, an estimated 21,380 people of all ages, 11,960 male, and 9,420 female in the United States will be diagnosed with AML. It is rare for the disease to occur before age 45. The average age at the time of diagnosis is 68 years. An estimated 10,590 deaths will occur during this year. The five-year survival rate for people with AML is approximately 27%. Two staging systems are commonly used for acute myeloid leukemia. The French-American FAB classification system is based on morphology to define specific immunotypes. On this slide, I show the World Health Organization classification, which reviews chromosomes, translocations, and evidence of dysplasia. Dr. Jurisic will go into this classification in more detail in his presentation. So let's have our first audience participation question. Acute myeloid leukemia is A, 1.3% of all cancers, B, a disease of younger patients, C, affects women primarily, and D, has a high treatment success rate. I'll pause while you record your answers. The answer for our audience question is A, AML constitutes 1.3% of all cancers. This next slide is the first of two slides on risk factors. AML can occur at any age, but it becomes more common as people get older. The only proven lifestyle-related risk factor for AML is smoking. 
long-term exposure to high levels of benzene is a risk factor for AML. Some syndromes that are caused by genetic mutations, and they're listed here, seem to also raise the risk of AML. On the second risk phase, some additional factors include exposure to high-dose radiation. Even radiation treatment for cancer has been linked. The risk varies on the amount of radiation given and what area is treated. The possible risk from exposure to lower level of radiation, such as imaging tests like x-rays and CT scans, are not well defined. There's also a correlation between patients who've been treated with certain chemotherapy agents during other cancers and the development of AML. This correlation is strongest with alkylating agents and platinum agents. There's also been speculation about a link between AML and exposure to electromagnetic fields, such as living near power lines, herbicides, and pesticides, but none of these links have ever been conclusively proven. With regard to the economic burden of acute myeloid leukemia, there aren't many published studies that have examined this cost burden. One study published in 2010 set the cost of induction therapy at $63,000. Given the need to hospitalize the patient upon diagnosis, this would be the biggest driver of costs and is related to both the cost of the hospital base and the physician payments. One induction th once induction therapy is complete, the costs then shift to the outpatient side and, the, and include costs for drugs and laboratory as we see with many other cancers. Like many cancers, there are indirect costs and burdens, some of which could be considerable. Dr. Jersik will examine treatment options in more depth. Current treatment for AML involves two phases. The first, induction therapy, is an intensive chemotherapeutic regimen that attempts to eradicate the leukemia and normalize blood counts. The second phase of treatment, post-remission therapy or consolidation, involves chemotherapy, potentially or possibly stem cell transportation, or both. The goals of treatment are to eradicate the disease as quickly as possible and induce complete remission, often at the cost of other aspects of the patient's health. The traditional chemotherapeutic regimen is associated with a number of side effects that range from unpleasant to life-threatening, including hair loss, mucositis, organ damage, myelosuppression, which may lead to deadly infections. This concludes part one of my presentation. I will now turn things over to Dr. Jurasek, to begin his presentation. Thank you, Dr. Cartarelli. So today I'll be discussing uh, the AML disease background, namely highlighting the pathogenesis and diagnosis of the disease, as well as the prognostic features and our current uh, state-of-the-art treatment options. And then I'll focus on some emerging treatments, including those that maximize use of existing agents, as well as some novel small molecules, uh, the FLT3 inhibitors, BCL2 inhibitors, and IDH inhibitors, and then finally a few of the antibody-based therapies that are also coming along. So when you think about AML and think about cancer in general, for that matter, you need to think about how normal cells develop. And so when we think of this, you have a hematopoietic stem cell that's shown in the cartoon on the left-hand panel. And this hemato uh, hematopoietic stem cell is capable of self-renewal. And so it can give rise to all of the normal blood elements. So there's a common myeloid progenitor and a com common lymphoid progenitor. What happens in AML is really two things. The first is that there's an oncogene that, uh, that occurs early on, either in the hematopoietic stem cell itself or just beyond. And this causes a lack of different differentiation. And so some of those are shown in the, uh, uh, some examples are shown here. The AML1 ETO gene, PML RAR alpha that's seen in acute promyelocytic leukemia, and the MLL gene rearrangements that can be seen in therapy-related myeloid neoplasms. So you have this block in differentiation, and then a second hit occurs, and this allows those cells to proliferate. And so again, I've listed some examples here of genes that do that, the BCR ABL, TEL, PDGF beta, NRAS and KRAS mutations, and importantly, FLT3 abnormalities, which can serve as a target for therapy, as well as CKIT mutations. So when you think about the pathogenesis of the disease, you can really kind of derive the, uh, from, from first principles, if you will, uh, the symptoms and signs of, of AML. The marrow is filling up with these leukemic blasts. It's stopping the production of normal white blood cells. It's stopping the production of red cells and platelets. 
And so because the patient is anemic, they're fatigued. They're bruising and bleeding because their platelet count is low. They're short of breath because they're anemic. They have fever because of infection uh, due, to, uh, due to the myelosuppression of the disease itself. And within that expanding, uh, confined, uh, within the confined space of the bone marrow, you can, you can imagine those blasts pressing against the, the bone itself, causing pain, particularly in the long bones. The same thing is true of the signs that are, that are shown here. They're pale because they're anemic, hemorrhaging because of, of uh, low platelets, ecchymosis and petechiae, the same thing there. Now, one other interesting point is that you can see hepatosplenomegaly in skin and gum infiltrations. This is particularly true in the monocytic subtypes of acute myeloid leukemia. So I guess the point here is that uh, leukemia can can kind of do any, anything it wants to. We normally think of it as a disease within the, within the uh, blood and the bone marrow. But here we can see infiltration in solid organs. Uh, when it goes into the skin, we call it leukemia cutis. Uh, and it can even form a solid tumor, uh, what's, what's known as a granulocytic or a myeloid sarcoma, or the older name for it was a chloroma. So again, leukemia can do whatever it wants to when it, when, whenever it feels like it. As far as, as far as prognosis, I think there are two important prognostic features that we need to think about. And the first is age. So shown, uh, shown on the left-hand panel of the next slide uh, is, is a population study that was done in Sweden. And they simply took patients who had all comers uh, and, and categorized them by age. And you can see for patients uh, less than 50 or even up to age 54, prognosis is, is reasonable, where long-term survival is achieved in approximately 40 to 50 percent of patients. And here this is largely because of more intensive therapies, increased availability of hematopoietic uh, stem cell transplantation. But once patients hit the age of 55, you can see the prognosis uh, gets worse and worse decade by decade. So that when people are in their 60s and 70s, the prognosis of the diseases or overall median survival is really only a few months. And these curves have not shifted uh, one bit over the, over the past, uh, past decade or even past two decades. Uh, and so it remains, it remains extremely challenging to treat this older population of, of patients with, uh, with AML. The second important point is that cancer is a genetic disease, and it is really driven by both chromosome abnormalities and, as we'll see in a bit, uh, individual uh, gene mutations. So this first important study that I'm showing here is actually a very old one from 1998. All of the patients in the study were treated identically. And then later, subgroup analyses were done. And it was noticed that patients who had a translocation between chromosome 8 and 21, as well as inversion 16, and even 15, 17 translocations, which we now treat entirely differently. This is associated with acute promyelocytic leukemia. And I'll, just, I'll touch on that in a bit. Even those patients had a better prognosis. You can see a 60% long-term survival uh, for these patients with so-called good risk uh, AML. On the other side of the coin, we have the poor risk patients who have abnormalities of chromosomes 5 and 7, changes in a gene at uh, chromosome 11Q23, that's the MLL gene, uh, as well as patients who have a complex karyotype, more than three cytogenetic abnormalities. So here, this disease is virtually incurable with chemotherapy alone, and long-term survival is seen in only about 5% of patients. And then we have a group in the middle, about 50% of the patients who have so-called intermediate risk disease. These patients, by and large, have normal karyotypes. There's been a lot of research over the past, uh, over the past decade trying to parse out which of those patients in the intermediate risk group Group are going to do are, are going to behave a little a little better and which are going to behave worse and so various individual gene mutations have been identified and we know that patients who have NPM1 mutations and uh, a double CEBP alpha mutation for instance have a better prognosis those patients who have a FLT3 internal tandem duplication have a worse prognosis and so all of these things are being factored now into our classification of AML so the next slide compares and contrasts the old French, American, and British, or FAB, classification system that dates from, 19, er, from 1976 to the more modern uh, World Health Organization classification uh, from 2016. And you can see that 
initially we thought of this disease just simply morphologically. The M1 to M7 uh, characterizations are all based upon how the cells look under the microscope, whether they're myeloblasts, whether they're abnormal promyelocytes, whether there's a mixture of mo monocytes and, and myeloblasts, etc. The change in thinking really occurred in 2008 with the first World Health Organization classification system, which was later modified uh, to the one shown here. And you can see that now leukemia is thought of as individual diseases characterized by specific chromosome and even, uh, even molecular abnormalities. So each of these is its own subtype, including the molecular abnormalities of NP, uh, NPM1 and the biallelic mutations of CBP alpha. So additionally, they've kept the category, category of AML with MDS or myelodysplastic related changes because we know that patients who have antecedent hematologic disorders have a worse prognosis. And so this was originally uh, originally developed to, to sort of capture those patients who we thought might have a myelodysplastic syndrome but was, was, was missed in its pre-leukemic phase. And again, we also know that patients who have therapy-related myeloid neoplasms have a much worse prognosis. So these are, these are patients who have been treated for, for, for prior cancers, whether it's with chemotherapy or radiation. And again, a, a, tough, a tough group to treat. Incidentally, these are the patients who also tend to have the poor risk cytogenetic abnormalities, uh, abnormalities of chromosomes 5 and 7 and 11Q23. All right, so when it comes to treating leukemia, not much has changed over the past 40 years, but I think there's some exciting new, new opportunities on the horizon. Still, the basic notion of induction therapy to restore normal hematopoiesis is, is in play. And the standard treatment here that's, that's been in place for, for nearly 40 years now is, is cytarabine, typically, typically given as a continuous infusion over seven days, and an anthracycline, usually either donorubicin or idorubicin. And again, there was some controversy over the proper dose of, of donorubicin. And what, what is clear is that doses of at least 60 milligrams per meter squared are necessary, and uh, in, in younger patients, up to 90 milligrams per meter squared. The old dose of 45 milligrams per meter squared of donorubicin is clearly inferior. When somebody presents with acute myeloid leukemia, they typically have about 10 to the 12th leukemia cells in their body. In order to produce a complete remission, we need to kill about 99.9% .9 of those cells, which sounds great, except if you do the math, that will still leave about 10 to the 9th leukemia cells in their body. So we refer to this as minimal residual disease, but it's really not so minimal. And the point of post-remission therapy is to address that problem of residual disease and prevent relapse. And that can be done with consolidation chemotherapy, typically with higher doses of cytarabine in younger patients, or stem cell transplantation. Earlier studies have shown that autologous transplant and, and high-dose cytarabine produce roughly equivalent results. And so autologous transplant, by and large, has fallen, uh, fallen uh, out of, the, uh, out of the treatment algorithms, but allogeneic transplant is certainly a mainstay of treatment uh, for this disease. And with newer technologies, where we can use half-match transplants, so-called haploidentical transplants, uh, and, uh, and umbilical cord blood as a source for stem cells, uh, the option for, for transplantation has been opened up to, to, to more and more patients. And then finally, we sometimes use maintenance therapy, which is lower doses of chemotherapy over an extended period of time. Uh, this is generally not done in, in, in most subtypes of AML. However, it, it may play a role uh, in, in some instances for acute promyelocytic leukemia, and is certainly a mainstay in acute lymphoblastic leukemia. So when we think about what happens uh, in uh, in uh, AML, uh, as we're giving induction therapy, we start with a bone marrow that's filled with leukemia cells. We give the 7 plus 3 chemotherapy, and if one were to do a bone marrow test two weeks into therapy, we would see that that marrow is aplastic. It's a desert. There's a few stromal elements, but not much of anything. And of course, this is also the most dangerous time during transplant because essentially blood production has stopped. So it, during that time period, we've taken all, an already weakened immune system by the disease, and we've weakened it further. And so bacterial infections can be quite common. We also worry about fungal infections a great deal. 
and, and typically will prophylax patients against fungal infections uh, because it is so common, aspergillus being the, the most common. We know that the chemotherapy will affect uh, normal cells throughout the body, and the cells that line the GI tract are, are very commonly affected, and so we can see mucositis, uh, we can see diarrhea, and all related to this breakdown uh, of the uh, cells lining the GI tract, which also serves as a portal of entry for bacteria. Finally, patients already have, uh, uh, have low platelets and are prone to bleeding, and we will make this worse. And so during this four-week waiting period from the time of the chemotherapy through aplasia, where we have the patients in the hospital, they're typically on four or five antibiotics during this, during this time period, receiving blood transfusions and platelet transfusions, sometimes on a daily basis. But at, at the end of all of this, if we have killed enough leukemia cells, we will actually then allow for the regrowth of normal blood cells, and the marrow will repopulate with a variety of, of normal cells, and, uh, and blood production will be restored. So that's induction. How do we decide who's going to get consolidation chemotherapy, who's going to get a transplant? Well, the, the next slide shows a, a, an algorithm and to, to help you think about this issue. And really, it's based upon availability of a donor and the biological risk assessment. So we, I showed you earlier that patients who have an 821 translocation and inversion 16 without a CKIT mutation have better risk disease. So we know that about 60% of those patients can be cured with chemotherapy alone. So for those patients, we would recommend high-dose uh, cytarabine-based consolidation treatments and avoid the risks of allogeneic stem cell transplant. So that part is easy. High-risk disease is also easy because we, we, I showed you earlier that those patients are virtually incurable with chemotherapy alone. And so we want to do everything possible to get them to allogeneic transplant, whether that's a matched sibling donor, a matched unrelated donor, a mismatched unrelated donor, a haploidentical donor, cord blood uh, stem cell source, all of these are options. We know that without this, uh, the, the, that the patient has a very low chance of, of cure. And so then we have the intermediate risk patients uh, right in the middle. So if you remember back from the uh, slide that I showed you earlier, about 40% of these patients can, be, uh, uh, can achieve a long-term remission with chemotherapy alone. And so here we have to, sort of re have to assess their risk a, a little bit more. So if they have uh, a matched sibling donor or a, uh, a matched unrelated donor, uh, then an allogeneic transplant certainly would be indicated. We can probably raise their chance of a cure to around 60%. Whereas if you have a mismatched donor, uh, a higher risk transplant, you might want to think about giving chemotherapy alone because there's still a 40% chance of a cure and reserving this higher risk transplant with greater risks of graft-versus-host disease and other complications only in the event of relapse. So another interesting strategy that has been used is the notion of a drug that delivers chemotherapy directly to leukemia cells. And there was a drug, gemtuzumab ozogamycin, that was initially improved, initially FDA approved for older individuals uh, with relapsed AML. But because of safety concerns that were raised in a randomized phase three trial, the drug was withdrawn from the market. However, more recently there's been a push to, uh, to reinstate the drug based upon an, a meta-analysis of five randomized trials using the drug. As you can see here, remission rates were virtually identical for patients at chemotherapy alone versus chemotherapy with gemtuzumab ozogamycin. There was actually a slight increase in 30-day mortality for the combination treatment, but there was a significant reduction in relapse rate resulting in improved disease-free survival and five-year overall survival for these patients. That benefit was seen mainly in patients with favorable risk disease and some patients with intermediate risk disease. So based upon this study, it is likely that gemtuzumab ozogamycin will be making a comeback and could be a standard of care uh, for patients with favorable, favorable risk AML. So everything that I've talked about really pertains to younger patients with AML. We know that the benefits of, uh, of intensive induction chemotherapy, though, do diminish with age. However, it's also clear from population studies that if the patient is fit enough uh, to, to tolerate an, a more intensive regimen, they will likely do better because their chance of a remission is higher, and that, that seems to predict for overall survival.
However, when, when we look at the chance of remission and the chance of survival, it certainly diminishes with age. So the, the next slide shows a very simple study that was conducted by the Southwest Oncology Group. They simply broke down results of patients decade by decade on all, on all of their intensive chemotherapy trials. And you can see that for patients uh, 55 and younger, we have a two-thirds remission rate that drops to a half uh, when you hit age 56. Uh, and of course, as you get, to, get into the 70s and, and, and over 75, it's even worse. Uh, around a third of patients will go into remission of age 75 or greater. And median survival, as you can see, also drops dramatically once you hit 56 and keeps going down from there. Uh, similarly, a dramatic drop-off in, in uh, disease-free survival once patients hit the age of 56. And so we need to think carefully when, when looking at older patients about whether they're able to tolerate intensive induction chemotherapy. And there are a number of tools that have been developed to help us answer that individual question. And you can see I've, I've summarized uh, many of them here on, on, on the table in the left-hand panel of the next slide. Most look at things like age, performance status, cytogenetics, whether the patient had an antecedent hematologic disorder, uh, and organ function. And basically, the, uh, the hematopoietic stem cell transplant comorbidity index is, is a catalog of, of organ function as well as other, other major, uh, major illnesses. So just to show you how this, this can predict, I've, I've shown the survival curve from the Contagion study of 2010, where he looked at four different, uh, different parameters, age, performance status, cytogenetics, and creatinine. And as you can see, if you had none of those, uh, uh, none of those adverse risk factors, uh, your 50 uh, the, the median uh, overall survival was, was uh, approaching a, about 18 months. And even if you had one, the uh, median survival was about a year. However, if you had two or more, survivals dropped dramatically. And clearly, for those patients, uh, one would not recommend an intensive induction chemotherapy. So sadly, this is, this is really the, the, the state of the art for most of our patients. The median age of diagnosis is now 67 years of age, and about a third of the patients are actually over the age of 75 when they're diagnosed. And we know without therapy, patients with acute myeloid leukemia will live on average of three months dying of infectious complications or bleeding complications. And remarkably, Looking at SEER data, it's only one-third of older individuals uh, with AML who were even offered any treatment. And that's because the treatment options for the older, unfit patient have really been quite limited. Uh, three options have, have been looked at, low-dose cytarabine, decitabine, and azacitidine. And as you can see in the, at the table on this slide, the chance of remission is in the 20 to 25 percent uh, range uh, with median survivals with therapy lasting uh, 7 to, to 12 months at, at best. So clearly, a lot of room for improvement for this older, unfit uh, population, a major, uh, major area of research. So I wanted to pause here and, and, and ask a question. We have a 22-year-old man who was diagnosed with AML. His cytogenetics showed an inversion of 16, and molecular studies showed a wild-type kit gene. He has one bro brother who was found to be HLA identical. Uh, he has achieved a morphologic and cytogenetic remission after one course of cytarabine and donorubicin. And what would be the next most appropriate therapy for this patient? One course of consolidation therapy followed by a matched sibling uh, donor transplant. One course of consolidation therapy followed by an unrelated donor transplant. One course of consolidation followed by an autologous transplant. Three to four courses of consolidation that include high-dose cytarabine, and finally, consolidation with all transretinoic acid and arsenic trioxide. So I think uh, in, in thinking about this case, we know that this is a patient with good risk disease. And based upon what, uh, what we saw earlier, uh, three to four courses of consolidation therapy would be standard. So now we'll move on to some of the, some of the newer therapies that are available. And one exciting drug is one known as CPX351. This is a liposomal formulation of cytarabine and donorubicin in a fixed molar ratio of 5 to 1. 
This was chosen uh, to increase leukemia cell exposure to these drugs at concentrations that maximize the synergy of the two agents and avoid antagonism. So CPX351 demonstrated significant activity against relapsed and refractory AML in an initial phase one trial. A second, and this led to a randomized phase two trial of, uh, of, of the drug in patients with untreated AML uh, aged greater than 60 years. Interestingly enough, there was no uh, significant survival benefit, but there was an interesting signal that was seen in the patients who had secondary AML among this poor risk group. And that was that there was an improvement in 60-day mortality, an improvement in event-free survival, and overall survival. And again, this important signal was followed up on in a follow-up phase three study looking at CPX351 versus standard induction therapy in older patients with newly diagnosed high-risk AML. So this next slide shows the schema. Patients with previously untreated high-risk AML ages 60 to 75 who are able to tolerate intensive chemotherapy uh, were, uh, were randomized to either CPX351 or 7 plus 3 donorubicin and cytarabine. And you can see patients were stratified for therapy-related disease, AML with prior MDS, with or without prior hypomethylating agents, AML with prior CMML, and de novo AML with MDS uh, type, uh, an MDS uh, karyotype. And again, there was also a stratification based upon age. So after induction, one to two cycles were allowed, which is standard. Uh, consolidation therapy could be given, or patients could proceed to a, an allergen, allogeneic hematopoietic stem cell transplant. And patients were followed uh, for death or up to five years. In this study, compared to standard induction chemotherapy, CPX351 resulted in a more than three-month improvement in median overall survival. The survival went from 5.95 months to 9.56 months with CPX351 versus 7 and 3. There was also improved event-free survival with CPX351 uh, compared to standard chemotherapy, and you can see the, the numbers shown there on the, in the right-hand panel. There was a superior response rate seen with CPX351 compared to standard chemotherapy, and also an improvement in 60-day mortality rates. And this was mainly due to the fact that there were less deaths due to progressive AML than to actual adverse events uh, with the, associated with the, with the new drug. So more patients going into remission. Uh, and interestingly, when they did a subgroup analysis looking at therapy-related AML patients, and this was just presented at, at ASCO uh, a few weeks ago, they saw the, 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 the same sort of findings, improved response rates and improved survival. The other interesting part of the study is that they did, they did a landmark analysis at, uh, at the time of transplant. And the first thing you'll notice on, on this next slide is that more patients were able to proceed to transplant who got CPX351 than those who received traditional 7 plus 3 chemotherapy. And among those patients that did go to transplant, there was a significant survival benefit. Uh, the median survival for the patients who were induced into remission with CPX351 uh, was, was not reached and was uh, 10.25 months for the group receiving standard chemotherapy. So what explains the benefit from CPX351? Is it the molar ratio that we're seeing that optimizes synergy? Is it the liposomal delivery system itself? Is it because fewer patients died during induction? Uh, is it because more patients were able to get to a potentially curative stem cell transplant? Perhaps the answer is all of the above. I think there's still some interesting uh, research questions that need to be addressed, and that is, will this work for younger patients or better risk uh, AML patients? And will it be useful in combination with other targeted agents, some of which I'll, I'll be talking about? But I do think that after approval, this drug should be considered uh, for frontline use in older patients with high-risk AML who are suitable candidates for intensive induction therapy. So now I'll move on to some of the targeted agents. And I'll begin by talking about the FLT3 inhibitors. So patients with AML harboring uh, an internal tandem duplication of FLT3 have a significantly shorter remission duration and poorer survival. Interestingly enough, those with the second type of FLT3 mutation, the so-called tyrosine kinase domain mutations, 
does not seem to have that same uh, that, that same prognostic effect. However, it becomes interesting because one of the mechanisms of escape from some of the inhibitors that I'll talk about is, in fact, a second clone that has a tyrosine kinase domain mutation, typically a D835 mutation. This next slide shows some of the uh, some of the FLT3 inhibitors that have been in clinical development, and as you can see, some are quite specific and interact only with with uh, uh, with FLT3 and a few other kinases. Others are not so specific, say like, my, for example, mitostorin, uh, which was recently licensed for FLT3 positive AML. And this is an important study because uh, the, the, drug was, the drug was recently licensed and now has become standard of care. Um, a phase three trial was conducted using this multi-kinase in inhibitor, mitostorin, in combination with donorubicin and cytarabine in patients with FLT3 mutated AML. And again, they could have both the internal tandem duplication or a tyrosine kinase uh, domain mutation. And you can see that there was a significant improvement in event-free survival and overall survival for the patients who received mitostorin in combination with standard chemotherapy. And so this has now become a new standard of care for this individual molecularly defined population. Other FLT3 uh, inhibitors are in development, ones that are even more specific. So quizartinib is currently in a phase three study looking at, looking at it in a single, as a single agent uh, versus uh, combination chemotherapy for, uh, for relapsed patients. And you can see it in, phase, in earlier phase studies, we'd expect a response rate of about 50% uh, in, in patients treated with quizartinib alone in the relapsed and refractory setting. Giltaritinib is also in a phase three study with a similar design, and in addition to hitting the ITD mutation, it also gets the D835 tyrosine kinase uh, mutations. And again, about half the patients will respond. And finally, cronolinib is in, in development, not quite as far along, but phase three trials are planned, uh, looking at this in, in the upfront setting, uh, donorubicin, cytarabine, and cronolinib, uh, versus donorubicin, cytarabine, and mitostorin, and also in the, in the relapsed setting with, uh, with traditional chemotherapy, plus or minus the cronolinib. So again, similar response rates. All of these drugs are, are, are quite active and um, anxiously looking forward to some of the results of these, these phase three trials. Another interesting target in AML is BCL2. So BCL2, is, is a uh, molecule that allows cancer cells to evade programmed cell death or apoptosis. And venetoclax is a molecule that binds to BCL2, freeing certain proteins that allow the cells to undergo apoptosis. As you probably know, venetoclax has demonstrated significant activity in heavily pretreated uh, patients with C CLL and is in fact licensed for patients who uh, have high risk disease with, uh, with 17P deletions. But venetoclax has also demonstrated significant activity in the setting of relapsed and refractory AML. And because of this, it's been taken forward uh, as a, uh, in combination with hypomethylating agents and low-dose cytarabine in the unfit older population of AML. So the response rate for venetoclax with the cytabine or azacitidine was higher than what, would, what we'd expect based upon historical data for either the cytobine or azacitidine alone. Response rates were around 60% when venetoclax was added to the hypomethylating agents versus the 25% response rate that we'd expect to see uh, with azacitidine. It's also interesting that when you look at the one-year survival of venetoclax with low-dose cytarabine, it was much higher than we'd expect for low-dose cytarabine alone. In fact, it was nearly 60% at one year as opposed to the 25% one-year survival that is seen with, with low-dose cytarabine. So this agent looks extremely promising, uh, and uh, phase three studies are now underway. Uh, the, the population, again, is older patients, unfit for standard chemotherapy, and the trial design is azacitidine with or without venetoclax. Another promising target is IDH. Uh, so IDH isocitrate dehydrogenase uh, is an important enzyme that generates energy for, uh, for cells, and we know that mutated, mutated IDH alters the genetic programming of these cells so that they remain immature and grow more quickly. 
So there are now several drugs in development that target both IDH1 and IDH2 or both. And the one that's furthest along is AG221. Uh, this is an IDH2 inhibitor that has produced responses in about 30% of patients with relapsed and refractory AML. It's also at a phase three uh, trial for older patients with advanced multiply relapsed AML. And this drug has, uh, is, is, is now under review at the FDA uh, and, uh, and may be uh, approved uh, Within, uh, within the next year. We also have targeted therapy uh, with, with monoclonal antibody-based strategies. And there are just several, several options I'd like to uh, mention very quickly. Uh, the first is SGN33A. This is an antibody conjugate targeting CD33, as we talked about before, but this time uh, with a perolobenzodiazepine uh, that is uh, the sort of a, the, the, the agent that's responsible for killing the cell. And again, when an initial study that was conducted, they saw a 75% response rate in older patients with untreated AML, not fit for standard chemotherapy, when this agent was combined with azacitidine. And so a randomized phase three study is now underway in that population. Another interesting strategy is a so-called bispecific antibody, one where we can engage a T cell uh, to, uh, to kill the targeted cell. And so the, a drug is under development, a AMG330, uh, which is analogous to blinitumumab for, uh, for acute lymphoblastic leukemia. Here, CD33 is targeted, as well as CD3. So CD3 is found on the T cell, brings the T cell into apposition with the leukemic cell, and thereby allows destruction of that cell. So early studies are underway. Uh, it's a bit premature to make any, any major proclamations at this point, but a very interesting strategy. And then finally, antibodies can be used to deliver uh, radioisotopes directly to tumor cells. And two are currently uh, moving along in development. The first uh, is actinium-225 labeled lentuzumab. Actinium emits an alpha particle which travels a very short range, allowing specific leukemia cell killing. And a phase one study, a response rate for uh, older individuals uh, with untreated AML in combination with low-dose erterabine was about, uh, was about 30 percent. Uh, so this is now moving forward as a single agent in a phase two trial. Additionally, there's an anti-CD45 antibody uh, labeled with iodine-131 that is being looked at in more ad uh, an advanced MDL, I'm sorry, an advanced AML population um, in, in, as part of a conditioning regimen for allogeneic stem cell transplant. And earlier studies uh, looking at this approach uh, produced um, long-term remissions in about 40% of patients with advanced MDS and AML. And so a randomized study looking at this compared to chemotherapy followed by transplant is, is now underway. So in conclusion, you can say that AML is characterized by both increased growth and impaired maturation of early blood cells. And I think I've shown you that chromosome and molecular abnormalities determine prognosis and now can be used to direct therapy. Better risk AML receives intensive therapy. High risk AML receives allogeneic hematopoietic stem cell transplant. Older patients need lower intensity therapies. Patients with FLT3 abnormalities will now get mitostorin in combination with their, with their chemotherapy. Newer agents such as CPX351 can better utilize our standard chemotherapy uh, in a more effective way. And I think this provides multiple, uh, a platform for, for um, multiple new strategies uh, over, the next, over the next few years. We can also see that these molecular abnormalities can serve as targets for therapy, uh, and I showed you that with the FLT3 inhibitors, uh, BCL2, and the IDH inhibitors, and that antibodies can be used both for intrinsic activity as well as for delivery vehicles for chemotherapy or radiation uh, to harness uh, the immune system. Studies examining these novel, novel combinations and targeted agents with conventional chemotherapy both for induction and post-remission strategies are urgently needed so that we can impact the lives of our patients with, with this very difficult disease. And so with that, I'll conclude my presentation. Now, Dr. Cardarelli will continue his discussion of AML from the managed care perspective. Thanks very much. Thank you, Dr. Jurisic. I think we can all agree that the treatment of cancer is very complex and expensive. Managed care organizations struggle to find the right benefit design that allows the patient to access the care that they need at a price that's affordable to both the patient and society. 
The Institute of Medicine has described quality medical care as patient-centered, safe, timely, equitable, efficient, and sustainable. To me, efficient and sustainable means the cost is central to quality. Cost is also central to achieving an equitable distribution of health care with timely access. Organizations attempt to provide this by balancing and developing coverage and benefit language that enables access while controlling utilization and managing costs to ensure the organization's survival. The Pharmacy and Therapeutics Committee review process is the primary mechanism for evaluating and coverage of determination of drugs. This process has three components, a clinical review, qualitative review, and a financial review. This approach considers the safety, efficacy, and financial burden of the product being reviewed. Decisions result in full or restricted access and impact both the use of the product and any monitoring or testing that would be required as a part of therapy. Certainly, the cost of new drugs is an important consideration in some of the challenges that managed care faces. In 2015, 37% of all healthcare spending was spent on specialty drugs. Spending on these drugs is expected to increase around 17% per year between now and 2020. Existing drugs will gain new indications and will be prescribed more frequently. Many drugs will now be used in post-acute treatment maintenance. All of these factors will increase utilization spend, which is bad enough, but the real increase in spend will come from brand inflation and soaring costs for these new targeted therapies. 56% of that cost coming from inflammatory conditions, oncology conditions, and multiple sclerosis. Looking into the future, the Pharmaceutical Research and Manufacturers of America report that there are more than 800 drugs in development for cancer. According to the Tufts Center for the Study of Drug Development, 73% of them have the potential to be considered personalized medicine. In addition to the run-up in costs and the pipeline pressures, these existing drugs will gain new indications and will be prescribed more frequently. Treatment cycles will extend beyond current recommendations. Many drugs will be used in post-acute treatment maintenance. There's also the issue of off-label use or out-of-approved use for some of these therapies. An important question to ask is, where is the evidence of success? How do we evaluate and determine the value of extending treatment? This creates several legal and ethical questions around balancing the appropriate use of agents with the perception, often cited by advocates, of withholding care. Managed care often describes benefits in two domains, those goods and services that are covered under the medical benefit and those which are covered under the pharmacy benefit. In many conditions, the treatments stay exclusively within the medical benefit or in the pharmacy benefit. This is not always true in oncology. Many chemotherapies have both a medical and pharmacy benefit component. This complicates the evaluation and the coverage of these therapies. Medications covered under the pharmacy benefit are easiest to track because the pharmacy system adjudicates claims in real time at the point of service, while office-administered medications are billed via a medical claim system where data isn't often available for upwards of 90 days. And it's sometimes very difficult to separate the cost of the drug product from the cost of administering the drug. This situation is actually compounded in Medicare, where some of the drugs are covered via the Part B benefit and covered under the medical side, and some others are covered under the drug benefit or the Part D benefit with coinsurance or co-payments. Clearly defining where medications are covered is important to the communication between physician and patient. When considering benefits for patients over 65, as I've already said, this is no small task. The Kaiser Family Foundation states that in 2016, there were 884 prescription drug plans for seniors across the U.S. with differing co-pays and co-insurance. Given the complexity, the odds of a physician and patient being able to make an informed decision about the economic impact of a treatment choice is rather challenging. With the increased number of new products coming to market, Many are expected to have high consumer demand, but are perceived to offer very limited value in offsetting other medical expenses. Managed care companies have created temporary out clauses. This clause allows the plan time to fully review the product, analyze outcomes, studies of data, gauge provider and family acceptance, and monitor post-market issues such as unexpected adverse events 
or drug reactions. Truly breakthrough therapies can be exempted from this process and can be covered immediately. The issues that are listed on this slide will always exist, but managed care has an obligation to provide as much clarity to the coverage as possible. In an effort to define value as it applies to therapies, a number of organizations have undertaken the task of determining which factors most responsible for providing value. Clearly, this is in response to the escalating drug prices. This slide lists four of the prominent players in this space. Their goal is to help physicians, payers, and patients understand the value of new therapies and thus make better choices about their use. Their initiatives have different missions. For example, ASCO and NCCN focus on cancer drugs, ACA focuses on cardiovascular drugs, and ICER's purview is broader and not specific to a particular class of drug. Each organization's framework accounts for factors underlying value, such as the quality of clinical data supporting the therapy use, the magnitude of its treatment effects, the likelihood of severe adverse effects, and the product's costs, ancillary benefits, cost effectiveness, and the effects on the health system budget. There is no universal definition of value, and each organization takes different factors into consideration in its evaluation. This next slide looks at both the domains of value as well as the metrics for accessing that value. It comes from a workshop that was held by the Institute of Medicine back in November of 2009. While the domains are self-explanatory, the metrics that are employed to assess value can spark considerable discussion. In the U.S., most of the discussion around quality of value has centered around topics such as evidence-based medicine or comparative effectiveness. In this era of limited healthcare resource, it's reasonable to consider value when making treatment decisions. Getting to a definition of value that we can all embrace remains a challenge. Let's also not exclude the patient from this discussion. Patients really want to build a partnership with their treatment team. They want access to quality care with compassion and respect. While all of these domains are very important, what is most important is that patients and families want hope. Partnering requires that clinicians actively interact with patients, provide them with the necessary medical information to make an informed decision, and engage the patient in both the conversation and decision making. In short, a working partnership of patient and clinician provides the foundation for patient engagement and empowers the patient to be the steward of their own health care. When making formulary decisions, C and P and T committees clearly prefer randomized clinical trials. When comparing drug effectiveness for diseases in which coverage decisions can be implemented. However, payers are, were interested in CER study designs beyond randomized clinical trials. Many committees value retrospective analysis such as claim analysis more highly than randomized clinical trials when comparing real world costs. Although payers value and use comparative effectiveness studies, much of the available research is inadequate to inform decision making because of a lack of relevant head-to-head -head comparisons, perceived lack of credibility of manufacturer funded studies, and the paucity of economic data. Regardless of source, this information must be peer-reviewed, patient-focused, and intended to supplement the current treatments or provide new approaches to undertreated populations. This next slide talks about new approaches to oncology care. Some of the value in care will come from these new approaches, with clinicians having access to enhanced patient-level data. This enhanced data will not only improve care, but can reduce the administrative burden of the claims process. And I suspect that there are huge improvements possible by improving our access to genetic testing, biomarkers, and improved imaging, which will allow clinicians to better target their treatments to the particular cancer that they are treating. I wonder if there's a place here for a collaborative practice, such as the medical home. While many of these services are very similar to what oncology practices currently offer, could an organized medical team with a highly defined responsibility and workflow provide efficient, patient-centered care that improves outcomes, lowers treatment costs, and provides an enhanced patient experience. No talk about oncology would be complete without at least mentioning biologics. And clearly, biologics have revolutionized the treatment of such chronic illnesses as rheumatoid arthritis, psoriasis, Crohn's disease, and multiple sclerosis, and are widely used in a variety of cancer. Biologics, as the name implies, are derived in some way from living organisms. 
The first generation products are literally obtained from humans or animals, such as human blood, insulin often from pigs or cows, or influenza vaccine, the viruses which are grown in chicken eggs. Second generation biologics rely on biotechnology for their manufacture. Biologics are composed of sugars, proteins, and nucleic acids, or complex combinations of these substances, and may be living entities such as cells or tissues. They're isolated from a variety of natural sources, as this slide shows, and can include a wide range of products. They're not simple to manufacture and difficult to duplicate. The outstanding questions on the topic of biologics are numerous. First and foremost, how long will it be before the FDA settles on a permanent definition of the terms biosimilar and interchangeability? There have been some approval of biosimilar drugs during the past several years. There are several other agents that are awaiting approval. There's extensive experience from Europe where biosimilars have been available for the last decade. In Europe, biosimilars have a very well-defined path to approval. What studies will the FDA be willing to accept to grant approval, and how comfortable will U.S. physicians be to prescribe these agents? And finally, how will managed care deal with these new products? What about the companies that currently market the originator compounds? Surely they won't yield market share without a fight. We should also talk about potential changes in the delivery of oncology care. I've already talked about the medical home concept, and although this concept has been around since the 1960s, in the past decade it's been adopted in many primary care settings and starting to be adopted in many specialty settings. In oncology, the care would be directed by the patient's oncologist who would lead the team depicted here, who collectively take responsibility for the care of the patient. Each team member would apply his or her expertise towards improving the overall health status of the patient. The major challenge to this approach is setting the correct reimbursement rates to support this type of practice. There are several studies done in the primary care space which have documented the value of the medical home concept. There are also ongoing demonstration products designed to further evaluate this concept. So in conclusion, managed care organizations can contribute to improved outcomes and reduced costs by increasing the understanding of current therapies, recognizing the potential benefit of future therapies, and developing an understanding of targeted drugs and their place in therapy. This concludes my presentation. Thank you very much for attending this webinar. We'll now be moving into the question and answer session.